Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're looking at the nomenclatures of, of what we refer to in theology as reversionism. Uh, most people don't have a definition for it. They don't think that it's an essential doctrine, apparently. But there's a difference between carnality and reversionism. And we're talking about reversionism today. Like I said in my prayer, you can be carnal and not in reversionism, but you can't be in reversionism without being carnal. In other words, so you can see that, car that reversionism is a step, a negative step, a negative in your Christian life beyond carnality. And that's what we're talking about. And we're talking about 14. These are not the only ones, but these are the, what I would consider major ones because they're misunderstood, they're misapplied, and they're, and they're misquoted. And, and a lot of people's life gets interrupted because of it. And so we, last week on Wednesday... Uh, we studied the first seven of 14 nomenclatures of reversionism. Now, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, 37 through 39, which is our lesson text, and it's the last of our lessons, there is a, there is a phrase in there taken from Habakkuk, the second chapter, 3 and 4, shrink back. If you have your Bibles to Hebrews 10, 37 through 39, you will see that word is used twice, out of Habakkuk, you see that? It's in quotation, and that quotation there, it's in italics, I suppose, and that comes from Habakkuk, and we did a study on that. We did a study on that, and because of that, I thought we should maybe identify why we refer to this by a title when they're 14. Trying to find one that fit all 14 was a very, is a very difficult task, and... Uh, my pastor teacher uh, was able to arrive at a word that I consider fits it very well, and he called it reversionism, and I do well because I can't find one that's better than that. It, 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 a, you're able to use it to cover all 14 nomenclatures. So last time we talked about seven of them, and we're going to talk about the seven, the last seven nomenclatures of reversionism uh, today. Um, let me recall to you at, in, at the third paragraph down from my introduction, in part of my introduction, is a theological definition of reversionism. That's very important for you. Uh, it should be reversionism. That's revisionism. It should be reversionism. That's misspelled. Uh, reversionism is a retrogression, and we learn that from Hebrews, the fifth chapter. <coughs> It's retrogression. In other words, when you get into reversionism, instead of, instead of being able to go forward in spiritual growth, you're in reverse. And the writer of Hebrews, the fifth chapter, uh, into the sixth chapter tells you that. And so that's where that comes from. Reversionism, again, look at your paper and where, where it says revisionism. That should be reversionism. Uh, reversionism is retrogression from any stage of spiritual enlightenment because of negative volition towards that revelation, whatever spiritual enlightenment you have, because of negative volition towards that spiritual enlightenment, because of cosmos diabolicus or worldly thinking that stands in contrast to it, which is promoted by Satan, the adversary of spiritual enlightenment. And I gave you a couple passages, Matthew 16. That's where Peter rebukes Jesus, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And then in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, he is our adversary, prowling around seeking someone to devour business. So that gives us kind of a definition of this. Um, now, so I'm at 8, 9, 10. I'm now at the eighth number going to 14. The nomenclature that we're interested in tonight comes from uh, Romans. So let's go to Romans a moment. 
we're going to look at Romans, the first chapter of Romans, where and verse 28, where this is found. And then we'll look at the context a little bit of it. This is a pretty heavy, chapter 1 of Romans is pretty heavy. And um, one of the things I want to do next year is go into Romans a little bit in the book. I probably won't go through the whole book, but I'll go through different sections of it like I did with Hebrews. But in Romans 28, our, our word is found there, reprobate. Like if you have King James Bible, it's probably reprobate in 28. If you have another translation, it would be called probably yeah. depraved depraved okay they're both good reprobate or depraved now here's what verse 28 says and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer God gave them over to a depraved mind or a reprobate mind to do those things which are not proper or actually indecent yeah Neither one of those English words fit what this is. Indecent would be better. Okay, and and so we're we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that now. I wanted to show you the word now. Did did I put on your page? Well, somewhere I know I have. I've put on your probably in verse twenty eight. Look down there in verse. Uh, I'm at the eighth nomenclature. See the word depraved mind. I put it in bold print. See the A in the front of that word? That's a that's an alpha privative, a negative, or without, without dokimas. And that's without being approved, without without approval. We'll talk more about it, without approval. And in this and it's like taking a here's what doki, dokimas is. It's like you've, you, you went to school to get a law degree. You graduated, but you can't practice law in the state unless you're approved by the state, right? So you have to go before a board to do that. Now, that's not the only profession. A lot of profession, professions are that way, right? So you have to, you have to, and so you've got to go there. What do they give you if you go through there? The bar exam. And then you get through, and now you can practice law. And they would call that dokimas. They would say, rather than paramas, they would say, now you're approved. Now you're approved by this state to do that. And um, you would think that in something like the United States, you could, that would be, if it was good in one state, it should be good in every state, isn't it? But, but it isn't, isn't it? No, you got to do it in every state because they each have their state laws that make it kind of unique. They so, right? I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Huh? Well, isn't that interesting? I see. Because each state, each state has, yeah. I don't know. Okay. I have no idea. I, I'm just, I'm just talking about something really simple here. Don't take me off a, into something complicated. This, this subject is complicated enough. But, but what, so what the idea is that this person is at a stage where he could, he's approved spiritually. He's at a spiritual good place in his life to move forward. And so he goes through some simple test where God wants you to apply. He's in, he's giving you spiritual enlightenment. And that's, that, that's the test now to take it to the full, full length of faith, right? Work it through the faith cycle and let's get, let's, let's get, you know, do what God has promised. Well, this word with the ah on the front of it, adokimas, means that they funked. Now, they didn't lose their salvation, but they flunked. So, listen, I don't, I don't know. I know you, you can flunk once and take it again, and I guess maybe three or four times. I don't know. Three times, three times. And then I don't know what you do. You're uh, become a pastor, I guess. That's the thing you become a pastor. Um, but here's the word depraved mind. It means without approval. But 
it, but it, it's at a pretty good state where the, the, passing this test is really important to your next step. It's very important to the next step you're taking. And so this, this, this is a pretty intense idea here, a pretty intense idea. Um, now, oh, let's go back to Romans 1. I want to show you something. I, I want you, if you have a study Bible, you'll probably see verse 24 in bold print, the, just the, the word 24, like in mine, 26 and 28. Uh-huh. Now, there's a good reason for that. And I'm going to tell you the good reason here. Watch this. For this reason, I'm in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over. Are you with me? Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over. Look at verse 28. Down in the middle of it, God gave them over. See that? That's why they're bold print. You know, we look, those are markers, aren't they? 24, 20, 26, and 28, they're markers. And so they're leading, and they're, they're, they're in a discussion on reversionism, and they're showing the progressiveness in it and how it affects the human soul. No, so watch this. Because the key is God gave them over. You with me? God gave them over to something because of reversionism. They, they, they went in there, so God, God says, okay, you're at a different stage. Now, if you stayed in spiritual enlightenment, you would have went to another stage. It would have been a positive. Now you're in reversionism. You go to another stage, and it's a negative. It's a negative on your soul because reversionism, you're in darkness, not in light. Okay, in your soul. Therefore, God gave them over. Now watch what, now watch what he gave them over to because that's what they're into. Listen, this is what they're engaged in up to their eyeballs. This is what they're engaged to up to their eyeballs. And God goes like, okay, you got it. And listen, I've pastored a lot of these people. I go down Jimmy Hale mission, go to the Salvation Army, go out to retention centers, go to prison. This is the kind of people you meet. Now you can meet them in a home too. You can meet them in church. But you meet these people. You know these people. These are not people that you don't know and don't work with and don't, it's not in your community. These people are everywhere. Now, here's what to say. Watch what he, now God gave them over to what they were up to their eyeballs in. Are you with me when I, when I say that? You, you, okay. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over to what? Watch this now. To the lust of their hearts, to the lust of their hearts. I mean, when you get to the lust of the heart, you're down into lifestyle behavior lust of their hearts to impurity watch this Th watch where this is at and what it affects where's it at where, where's this reversionism taking root in in the heart well what's affecting the body watch that now therefore god gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurities that their bodies, in other words, this is something that's going to destroy their life, listen, physically, because they're, all, it's, they're already destroying themselves spiritually, emotionally, you, mentally, you name it. Are you with me? And so eventually what you become in your soul, you live out in your body. And listen, a Proverbs, for example, tells you a lot. You, you want to know how to rot your body? Rot your soul because your body will come. So the lust of the heart is to impurity that their bodies might, watch this now, and what are they going to, there's, they're going to do something with their bodies that were, they weren't created for. They were not created for this. The body's not cre created for reversionism. Reversionism affects it. It was created to be the temple of God. To be the temple of God, to be the place where God dwells, the place where God shines his light so that the, the person in the deepest part of darkness can see it. Are you with me? Ah. That their bodies might be dishonored. Their bodies might be dishonored. What's, what's going on in their heart is causing them to do uh, just unbelievable things to their body. I mean, you've seen it with all kinds of addictions in people's life, have you not? Jeez. All right. 
Now, he's going to explain it in verse 25. What was going on in the Roman church? What was going on in the Roman society? <laughs> For they exchanged. Now, watch the word, watch the word exchange. It's a big deal. You're going to find it. It goes with God gave them over and the exchange. There's an exchange. God gave them over. Uh, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's cosmos diabolicus. That's what we call cosmos diabolicus. Worldly thinking that stands in contrast to the truth of God's word. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. See, that's what he's been engaged in in the first chapter prior to us getting where we are. Who is blessed, the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Verse 26. See, there's one part of this. Look at verse 26. For this reason, right, the rotting of the soul has now become the rotting of the body, right, spiritually speaking. God gave them over, verse 26, God gave them over. Here, see, there, look at, you got it, don't miss this. Here is one stage. And it's only going to get worse. They're walking in darkness. They're walking into reversionism. This, here is verse 24. Now we're in verse 26. There is a natural progression. It, th this is the way reversionism takes you. J just like spiritual enlightenment it takes you to spiritual maturity and super grace. This takes you to the depths. Uh, this takes you to the depths of depravity. To the depths of depravity. The depths of, listen, and these are people who should have never been there. These are people that they had good backgrounds, possibly good, good families, good stuff, good stuff. They chose to make bad decisions. And once they get into that reversionism, it just takes them down the pike. So they're moving into darkness and depravity. Watch verse 26. Now, God gave them over to degrading passions to degrading. You know, I mean, it is the degrading. There is no sense. There is no sense of worth. You've lost all your common sense of humanity about the worth of your being. You know how bad that is? When you, when you lose a sense of the worth of your being, your humanity. I mean, this is, you know what that is? What, that, what that's attached to in every human being is that we've been made in the image according to the likeness of God. And you've gone into reversion where you throw it under the bus. Your own self-worth, which is based on you being made in the image according to the likeness of God. You're not an animal. And, and, and listen, you're going to move into stages of that. Because this stage you just went from doesn't give a hoot about God. It will worship the creature rather than the creator. Therefore, when that happens, they lose this sense of self-worth. By that, I mean the, just the sense of worth of their humanity. Degrading passions for their women exchange see the word exchange the natural function that's the god given that's the natural god given everybody has it for that which is unnatural which god did not sign off on and in the same way also the men abandoned natural functions of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men, committing indecent acts 
and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Listen, into their, listen, not only into their body, they'll pay a penalty in their body, but in their soul. Notice he said he used body up there in verse 24, 25, he used body. Verse 26 and 27, he dealt with person. And I did too. Did you, did you see me do that? I said, you lose your sense of worth. Did I not say that? That's what I'm talking about. When did that happen? In that first stage, when you threw God under the bus. You know, the next person to be thrown under the bus is you. I'm talking about the you of you, the worth of you. And listen, if you're going to go out and have a ministry with people who are in this stage through addictive behavior, alcohol, sex, whatever it is, there, there are a multitude. Listen, you can find this stuff in the business world uh, out, of, out of power lust. It don't have to be body lust. It don't have to be sexual. But there are addictions are all over the place. Just because you wear a tie and 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 think you're better than the drunk on the street, you're not in reversionism. I mean, you're not. Everybody's in reversionism. Is in reversionism. But here he's dealing with specific ones because he's got specific problems with them. In Rome. Now verse 28. And look. We're, look at. We're moving. Listen. This thing. Reversionism. You just don't enter reversionism. Re once you get into reversionism. It takes you down the pike. You're growing in it. But it's a fungus. But you're growing in it. It's darkness. You're growing in it. Just like if you stayed with the word of God. You would grow spiritually in it. That's what people miss about this stuff. Verse 28. And just as, because they've done it once and they did it twice. Now we're a third time, right? We're a third stage. We're in a third stage of reversionism. And just as they did not see fit. Just as they did not see fit. To acknowledge God any longer. Right? We knew that. God gave them over, this is the third time, this time to a depraved mind. To a depraved mind. That's depravity. Depravity. Listen, depravity is the last rung, you know, a ladder rung. Did I say that right? That sounded right, but then... People kind of look at me weird, and I think, ah, I did it again. Last rung, listen to me now, of your humanity. You're on a last rung. That's a depravity. There is nothing lower than depravity. There is nothing lower than humanity. Than, than this stage of reversionism, nothing. This is this is a last. You go beyond this. Even people that love you dearly will pray. They got to be merciful and take you. Because what people do to you what people would do to you at this stage is roadkill. Because you've lost all sense of your humanity. And the vultures know that. The vultures of humanity know that. And they treat you like roadkill. That's what vultures do, don't they? Is that what wrote? They keep our highways clean. Mm -hmm. 
if you got somebody in your family that's in any one of these stages, you ought to be on your knees praying to God Almighty because where they're headed. And we as church people should not be passing by like, listen, we could rescue a lot of them. We could rescue a lot of them. I've seen a lot of them rescued. You got to get them though because there is no, when they, after this one, Chuck Farmer, got it. This passage, this teaching on reversionism blew the doors off in his life. He tracked them. He went to every place where these people hung out in this city. Appealed to him every week. Right, Mac? Mike went with him. A lot of you did. A lot in this room went with him. And he was driven. He was passionate about it. You know why? He had the gift of evangelist. And he understood that the only way these people could be rescued, and they could as long as they're still alive, no matter what kind of shape they are, they could be rescued they could be rescued. And listen, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can rescue them. This is why Christ came and died on a cross. Verse 28, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved minds to do those things which are indecent. And, and listen, he just talked about it. being filled with unrighteousness and wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And, all they know, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do them, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And left to their own, they will die a miserable death. Left to their own. Did you, you notice the exchanges that are being made? Huh? Listen, you always give up something. Listen, if you're going spiritually, there are exchanges made. You do know that. You're not growing if there's not exchanges made, being made. You're giving off some of the bad stuff for yourself to get some of the good stuff of Christ? Come on. If you think, listen, you're not going to get this by sitting in church. If the church doesn't set in you, if the word of God doesn't get, listen, there's exchanges made all the way. I'm giving up that for this. Wow. then you ought, you, ought, you ought to get into the exchange system. That's what we talk about when we say take off the old man and put on the new man. There are exchanges. And listen, in reverse them, there are exchanges made. And the, the part about it is just drops you deeper into the muck and mire, right? Now I'm going to tell you, if you got anybody, I got one right now up in Michigan in my family. And you think I can get my people on their knees to pray for this guy? <coughs> Got two. Two people. They go, oh, well, you know, there's a phrase, going to hell in a handbasket. That's who these people are. That's how we view them because we don't take it serious. If we really believe that, that and they are, if, if we really believe that, and you know that you have the answer to their problem? Come on. If you can't talk to them anymore because they won't listen, you hit, you hit them on your knees. 
to whatever their life is and how bad it looks to you now when it comes time to check out it is not going to be it's not going to be pretty and it, unless it doesn't have to be you know how you can get out of reversionism tell me how you can get out of reversionism confess your sin that's the first step confess your sin then repent change your mind you don't have to stay in that you can come out that's the good news God is able. God is willing. You have to stay in that muck and mire. But anyhow, that's number eight, depraved mind. Number nine, a lawless attitude in action. Look at this in 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter a moment. Well, Peter hits this thing. He's the only guy that really does what he does here. Lawless attitude. I mean, the second chapter, verse 6 through 9, just to grab it. Let's see, second chapter, 6, 9. And, and he's talking about Noah's day, and he's going to talk about Lot. He's been talking about Noah. Like, a, and Look up at verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to pits of darkness. Of course, he's talking about Hades. He's talking about Tartarus. And committed them to darkness reserved for judgment. These are the angels that were involved in Genesis 6 and the Noah's flood and did not spare, and he continues in verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought on a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Then he says in verse 6, if he, if he, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, so he goes to a second illustration. If he, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, notice we found the word ungodly used twice in this. One for the, listen, the entire world went out on Noah's flood. It was called the antediluvian. Verse 7 goes on to discuss the Sodom and Gomorrah. And if he rescued, thank you, Jesus. And if he rescued, God is always in the rescue business. He's a first responder guy. If he rescued righteous Lot, saved Lot, a saved person, Lot by name, oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. See, that's our word, unprincipled men. That's the best they could do for it. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, a believer, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. Then we can conclude something. Then we can conclude something. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And then he goes on. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Listen, you've probably heard people say, as long as you've got the breath of God in you, God has, God has some purpose to deal with your life. I mean, as long as you're breathing. I mean, that's, that's why you keep going out and telling the good news. Because, listen, God wants to rescue people who are alive. He wants to rescue them. There's nobody, there is nobody that he's not willing to rescue if they'll come through Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through Christ, but he'll take anybody who will. You know, the more doctrine you learn and the more spiritual you become, listen to me now the more evangelical you should be. The more evangelical. What bothers me a great deal in doctrinal churches, it seems like the more we grow, the less we go. That's not biblical. The more you grow, the more you go. And that bothers me. I can tell you that bothers me. That bothers me. Something's wrong in that picture. I mean, the very last act of Christ on earth was for the unsaved. 
but so was his first one. I want us to focus on the word rescue and the word unprincipled men. I want you to be sure that we never forget this idea that no matter how bad the situation is in another person's life, God can rescue him, but he uses us. Look, we know the, the, we know the story of Latin. This is what he's talking about. Agreed? Listen to me now. Listen to me. How do you rescue Lot? Hey, Abraham, you got that right. When you read Genesis, the 18th and 19th chapter, and you read this story, what did Abraham do? But he got, I mean, he prayed to paint off the wall. Right? He stayed on his knees with God until he got an answer he, that he, was, he could be content with. If you know the story, well, if there's 50, will you? If there are 20, will you? He finally got down to his number. And God said, look, I know what number. You could have went right there right away with me. But I like your attitude. And so when the angels go in to destroy Sodom, God gives them instructions who they're going and who they're, who they're to destroy and who they're not, Right? This is called rescue. <laughs> I love it. One word covered 18 and 19 of Genesis, all that Hebrew. Which is so difficult to study as you get older because of those little dots. That's what I'm saying. Listen, we're part of a great rescue. Part of it, part of it is prayer, part of it is service, part of it is being out there, eyeball to eyeball. It's all part of a big picture. Little word, rescue. That's a big word to God, though, isn't it? It may look like that first responder guy right there. I mean, God's whole mission in life is first responders. Will you become a first responder for Christ? You're on the scene. You're the first one on the scene. Give them the truth. Give him the truth. And so we have that here. If he rescued righteous lot oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. Now look at the word. This is the only place it's ever found. In fact, this word is a very difficult word to find any information on. You have to go to Greek culture. You have to go to Roman culture to find it. Notice it has an alpha privative on it. And then it's the word thesmos. And this is a word for law custom. Laws that involve custom. It's kind of an interesting word that's being used here to describe the rescue of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, the culture of just depravity. I mean, that was only part of it. The just depravity of, of human life, just depravity. And God went in and took out the whole culture there depravity he rescued lot oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men it's called unprincipled men it, the word in the word means lawless lawless to a place where there ought to be a law and there isn't listen laws the laws are, as you engage in all of this lawlessness, as you engage them, you get down to the bottom rung. There's no more law for what's after that. I mean, you've, you've gone down. See, law structures the society way we deal with each other. Well, when you get to the bottom, there is not on the last one. You're in a total state of depravity. There, you've lost all your humanity, laws for humanity. The, and so they picked a word. Peter picked a word. And he coined it in this passage. It's just kind of interesting. 
And here's what we learned from this story. We learned that forewarned, and in fact, I think it, let, let me see. Let me see, six. The Lord knows how. Well, my, let me go to the third, third chapter. I want to go to the third chapter in this, in verse 17. 317. I'm in 2 Peter 317. Yeah. What's this? He, he's going he's gonna to do this again. He's going to use the same word in the third chapter, verse 17. The good thing is the English is going. How did the King James do unprincipled men? I forgot to look. And well, look at three three seventeen. It's in three seventeen too. You therefore, beloved, knowing the for this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. Th these were these were teachers that were doing it as well. Lawless. lawless. That lawless is a good translation. What did yours say? Yeah. It says what? Wicked, wicked is good. See, this, this is in the English, the closest you can get to it, the closest you can get to a definition is called wicked or, I wrote it down, you, call, you can call it wicked or um, lawless. Wicked, wicked or lawless. But, it, what, 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 but it, the word that's used is that there's not even a law that can cover that. Uh, I mean, what kind of law can you cover when you've lost your total humanity? That there's none, see? And so he, 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 but my point in verse, in verse seven, third chapter, verse 17, is, is a, a principle of doctrine that says forewarned is forearmed. Forewarned is forearmed. See, he says things like, be on guard. And you know what verse 18 says? 318? That's my very, very favorite verse. I use that. That's, that's a motto of my personal ministry. Grow in grace and knowledge. Grow in grace and knowledge. I'm driven by that passage every day of my life. Um, and, and you know what's interesting? The word knowledge in that, in that word? Is gnosis, not epinosis. It's, it's gnosis. It's basic knowledge. Basic knowledge is fundamental knowledge of the word of God. You got to have basics. That's, you know, basics. Uh, basics of the Christian life. I, I just find that answer. Well, I'm going to do one more and then we'll be back to this next week. It doesn't sense getting in a hurry, is there? Do you want to know this stuff? Yeah. See, I have a tendency to just want, well, I've heard this and let's just move on. But I think some of these things, because listen, they're cultural in our day. Yeah. Oh, I know. We all do. Yeah. If you're in the police people, you, you really see it. So, um, so let's just quit. Let's just quit there and have prayer. Well, I mean, I'm at a good time. And we'll come back to this subject. I don't want to open the next one up because, you know, we're there too. <laughs> we got that too. So let's just wrap this one up. Let me, let me put where we are. Yeah. Right. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, I, I just use the term uh, uh, rebellious believer. That'd be fine. Uh, every, rebellion or rebellious translates into every language as it's translated. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's fine. Rebellion is kind of part of that next one, despising. I mean, rebellion is, I mean, when he describes the children wandering in, we'll see this next time, but when he talks about the wandering of the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, he, he, one of the key words that he uses there is rebellion. He, he, calls it the, he calls it the rebellion. It was true with the angelic conflict, too. He calls it the rebellion. When we slip up and commit a sin, and then we come back in humility, uh, we are not in rebellion. No, no, that's carnality. No. Continual, and to refuse to come back to the Lord's 
Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's no doubt. That's, that's, that's taken yeah, and I think it's really important when you do that is to, is to explain the difference between carnality and reversionism or, or, or rebellion. Uh, if I had to pick one out of the 14, I'd probably pick backsliding or something like that. They're very familiar with that word. It, but culture is a very important. You got to play when you're in a different culture. You have to play with a different. You have to. You have to fit it. I mean, all the guys did it. Yeah, that's fine. It's, that's true. In fact, the rebellion is what it's called. Uh huh. Well, at some point they're going to get there. They'll start with car carnality. They'll be go through disciplines. Carnality will bring you to disciplines. When you go past the disciplines, you're into reversion. As now you're in deep trouble. But listen, it don't I mean you're in deep trouble as far as how the discipline's going to roll over you. But listen, it, in a heartbeat you can come back. I mean, you know, Leviticus the 26th chapter verses 40 and 41. This is at the at, at the end of the five cycles of discipline, after telling you what the fifth is going to like, he tells you, but you don't have to. You can recover from uh, all of them, even the fifth. He says, confess your sin and return. I think that's just being smart and patient. There you go. Well, that, that's the reason we, we use it. But, but culturally, you have to find it when it fits because you, you don't, you're not going to be there for a whole year to build, build doctrine upon doctrine. I mean, and you're on one subject, so. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll let the Internet people leave us. And the Internet people, hey, you come back next week. We'll finish this. We, we've just now got into it. So you come on back next week with us. Father, we're so thankful for these that have attended our study and, and been attentive. You know, it's one thing to get att attendance. It's another thing to get attention. When you get them both, it's just a great day. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you that the Holy Spirit has that kind of magical power uh, in our lives uh, as a church. And uh, I pray, Father, as we look at this, and, and we, we de we'll probably do a study that shows the difference between carnality and reversionism because the people on the Internet need to know that. So we'll, we'll look at this. Uh, but here today, Father, we, we conclude our, our, our service here to go into needed prayer within our congregation uh, so many, so many needs, Father, so many needs, and uh, we thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. Every day when we see prayers answered, we're so thankful that we have a God that hears and responds. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin be sin for us.